welcome. I'm Maggie Mahan, the Assistant Director for Community Engagement with the State Historical Society of Missouri. Thanks so much for joining us today. As the Associate Director of the Cape Girardeau Research Center, Bill Edelman presents the fifth installment in his Beginning Genealogy Workshop series. Today's program will focus on land records, researching first title. If you need to catch up on previous installments of this series, or would like to rewatch any of the segments, you can view them on demand on the State Historical Society of Missouri's website, which you can access at shsmo.org. All events in our virtual programming series are made possible thanks to the generous support of the State Historical Society of Missouri's members and donors. You can visit our website to learn more and see how you can add or renew your support. Thanks again for joining us. And now I will turn things over to Bill. Thanks for being here today, Bill. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, the, this presentation and the next one will be about land records. And I'll, I'll give you a warning. This is an area that interests me probably more than any other area of genealogy. So uh, I guess uh, hold on to your hats. The first part of this is getting the land uh, from an entity, a government entity, typically to individuals. And so uh, we're going to talk about how to research first title. What we've got in the background is a plat map that you'll probably see again later. So uh, with that, I want to talk a little bit, first of all, about land records in general and what you're going to get from them, but also uh, a little bit about why land records. Um, first of all, we're gonna talk about why land records are important and how first owners got land. And that varies depending on the state we're talking about and the time period we're talking about oftentimes. How was land delineated and described, which is one of the more confusing things to people if they're not already familiar with land description uh, when they first get started. So how do you locate your ancestors' land? How and where do you find land records? So first of all, why are land records important? Well, in many locales, they may provide a more complete uh, list of individuals than the census. The estimate in many areas is that 80% of adult males own land uh, at one time or another. And considering censuses and people being missed in the census and moving around, uh, it may actually be a more complete listing to look at land records. Land records provide more detailed and complete information than tax lists or court records. You have detailed information on where the land is and oftentimes details on how they got it and uh, maybe who they're selling it to and uh, where they are at a given time. So uh, they can supplement probate records Oftentimes the heirs had to sell land uh, if their uh, parent died or a relative died. They may be the best proof of relationships. People might, uh, uh, I'll give you an example that we'll see in a minute about uh, a land grant in Missouri and it lists how many children the individual had at the time of the land grant. Um, and you can kind of cross check that against other records to figure out uh, who they were. But also there may be direct proof about, it may say his son or uh, her father or whatever. Maybe the only records prior to 1850 that mention the wife's name. Now that varies depending on the state. Missouri, that's definitely true. North Carolina, you will not see the wife mentioned unless she actually was the uh, person that inherited land and her husband acting in her behalf. Uh, because the law in North Carolina did not require that the wife helped convey the land. We may also find the name of the wife and her dower status. Dower was uh, uh, something from English common law where the wife was entitled to a third of all the husband's property as long as, after he died, as long as she remained unmarried and uh, survived. After that, it went to her heirs or the children, her husband's heirs. 
she had to relinquish that dower if the land was conveyed or she could legally come back and claim a third of it while she was alive. We can find children and heirs listed in land records. We can find past place of residence. Sometimes people uh, arrived in an area and bought land and it might say in the land record of formerly of so-and-so location. If the grantor had moved, it may provide the current place of residence, now of Dallas County, Texas, uh, as an example. It can provide us with dates of residence, when they purchased land or got land granted, and then when they sold it and left. You can at least narrow that down. It can provide some idea of economic status. Well, obviously, if they didn't own land at all, uh, their economic status was either not good or they just chose not to buy the land. They may have leased it or rented it, but uh, the size of the land, uh, items that are on the property will tell you about economic status. Literacy of ancestors, they had to sign deeds, which we'll talk about next time, but use that with caution. What I found is that uh, there are many situations where if an individual was quite elderly, they might sign with a mark, when, whereas 30 years earlier, they actually signed with a signature. An excellent way to identify friends, associates, and neighbors, the fan club that uh, I've referred to before and will refer to again. There are a lot of terms connected with land records that uh, may kind of throw you for a loop. And that's why I've included a glossary in the handout. That glossary is good for this presentation, but also the next one on uh, title transfers after first title. So one is relinquishing uh, dower, right of dower, which I've just talked about. Most people get that confused with dowry, which was uh, property that was offered up front in a marriage. And dower is a different concept entirely, so don't get those confused. There are, uh, first thing when we talk about first title that we have to get straight is that there are state land states and then there are public land states. And state land states actually uh, granted first title to the first landowner, to the first owner of title, I should say the the first European owner of title. Um, that includes the original 13 colonies. It also includes some states that were either part of the original 13 colonies, like Kentucky was part of Virginia, Maine was part of Massachusetts, or they were independent for a time and did their own land grants during that time period, but there was still lots of land left. And so they became a public land state thereafter when, when they uh, reached territory status. Hawaii, Texas are examples, uh, to a certain extent, Vermont. Other states are considered public land states, but there are caveats on that with some states. In a few states, most of the land was in public domain and sold as I'll describe later in, with public land, but there were land grants that predated ownership by the US. Missouri is a prime example of that, but also Arkansas and Louisiana. There were many Americans particularly who had crossed the river and settled prior to the Louisiana purchase, left the US territory and settled in the uh, under the auspices of France and then Spain and uh, were granted land for settling. As a result, we've got two different systems going on, particularly in counties along the rivers. In state land states, there, there's a four step process typically. There may be slight modifications of this, but it's usually the case before someone could get title to land. First of all, they had to apply for it. Sometimes that's called entry because you actually entered the location of the land roughly and your name uh, with the state or with the king's representative if it's early on. 
or with the proprietor's uh, representative, and you had to enter an application. Then you were given a warrant for survey. Now, depending on the rules, you either had to pay money up front and then get a warrant, or you might be paying during the time that the warrant was active. Then the warrant for survey was actually for the surveyor to survey the property. They surveyed the property. And then once everything was paid up and all the paperwork was cleared, the uh, landowner was granted a patent or the title. So a little bit more detail on each of those steps. First of all, uh, the application. The applicant recorded the amount and location of the land. And a lot of times that would be on, uh, on the headwaters of Clear Creek or uh, and 200 acres. And it wouldn't get real specific because the surveyor was gonna make it a little bit more specific. But a lot of times you'll see the phrase to include the uh, applicant's improvements, which would be cabin, outbuildings, clearings, crop fields, and so forth. And then whoever you were purchasing it from, these are typically brief, just a brief entry. And because there's not necessarily any payment for the land at this step, many of these stopped at this step. And they may have gone no farther. The person may have moved away before they ever got title of the land, or they may have signed it over to somebody else. So there may, may actually be just an entry record for an ancestor. And there may be no record at all. They may have just sat on the land and never bothered to enter it. Payment may have been immediate. It may have been in installments or may have taken years. Then the warrant for survey. Now we're getting into documents that are a little bit longer than just an entry. It's a statement authorizing a survey at the applicant's expense. And it's usually, but not always, usually upon completion of payment then the surveyor would go do the survey. In other words, you better pay me up front. It usually included information concerning the entry and basic location information. So adjacent to somebody else, and it would name the person uh, uh, on the north side of the, mount, of the mountain. Uh, you'll notice here in this one down at the bottom of the first paragraph, join in, joining Jacob Sides, Conrad Wills, and John Edelman. Uh, this is from Lincoln County, North Carolina. And uh, so those would oftentimes be mentioned. And then there might be some directions to the surveyor. Uh, put it roughly here and not here, in other words. Then the survey, which typically would have a sketch. Uh, it included a meets and bounds survey. Meets and bounds is distances and bearings for lines. And then it would have corner descriptions. Now, th this is where people get confused because a lot of these corners no longer exist. They may exist in the form of an iron stob that's been driven in the ground since then, but there'll be trees, piles of rocks, wooden stakes, variety of things. And the trees are, of course, mostly gone and the stakes are rotted away, but uh, modern surveys have generally clarified that. And then distances and compass bearings, a plat drawing with the survey lines and calls, that is the distances and bearings between the corners. And it was signed by the surveyor and the survey crew members. Uh, typically, there would be a surveyor, a chain bearer, an ax man, uh, and a compass man or a sketch man, depending. And these are dated as well. So you can get an idea, hey, wow, they didn't survey this for three years after the entry. Well, it's probably because the payment wasn't made. And then finally, there's the patent. The patent is issued on the filing of the survey and completing any remaining payment uh, or presenting a warrant documenting payment. It may have also been recorded in the deed book. You'll see this quite a bit. It, it's at a state level, um, or it's in, and it's also in the deed book, and they just duplicate the information. A lot of times it's good to look at both because people copy these things and they are desperately boring to copy. 
And so the copyist may have made mistakes and you'll plot something out and you'll say, wow, this doesn't make sense. Then you look at the version in the deed book and it turns out they got the wrong direction in one of the bearings. So it's always good to look at both if they exist. The Missouri land grant process was a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a variation on the basic theme. So what happened in Missouri was you had to get permission to settle, particularly if you were an American, because you were coming from outside the realm into the realm, uh, the Spanish regime. And so you had to have permission to do that. And then either the governor or the governor's designee granted land. And it uh, maybe for a variety of reasons, uh, not only to settle and use the land, but also one of my ancestors was a German, second generation German who came from North Carolina immediately before Missouri. And they settled Germans out to the west side of Cape Girardeau district to serve as a buffer against the Osage that, who had been attacking some of the outlying settlements. Well, the end result was the Osage had pretty much finished with attacking at that point. So it never really came about, but they did call on those people for militia. Um, then there was a survey. So you didn't have an entry, you had permission to settle and, and there was kind of served as an entry with the uh, intendant in this case, this guy in the, and this painting is, uh, represents Louis Laramier, who was the intendant for the Cape Girardeau district. Then there was a survey done, and that was usually uh, kept by the, uh, the colony, by, the, by Louisiana. And then there was a title granted, but sometimes not. And in any event, none of these titles were honored at the Louisiana Purchase. They had to be confirmed. And that was a gigantic mess. It was included to, or it was intended just to confirm titles to these settlers who had been there before the Louisiana Purchase. They're called in, in as a group private claims. There was a board of land commissioners formed and they had to take evidence from claimants who were claiming land. The claimants had to provide witnesses to back them up and then the board either confirmed or rejected the claim. If they, were, if they confirmed it, there was a survey done, there was a title granted and yay, you were okay. If it was rejected, you had to try again or it was you just gave up or you filed a lawsuit. Because there were so many lawsuits filed, there's actually a second board of land commissioners uh, after uh, the first board to try to straighten these things out. And they ended up not granting a very high percentage first go around, but then a much higher percentage second go around. These things, if you thought you were getting free land to come out to Louisiana before Louisiana purchase, it ended up being a major mess because it wasn't all settled until about, until 1836. So that, that's what I was just talking about, a bit of history. The first board ended in 1812, and most of the firm claims were granted by the governor, and they didn't, they, they weren't so strong on accepting the lieutenant governor or intendant's uh, grants. The second board was 1832 to 35, and then Congress confirmed and endorsed that in 1836. When people came in, they had a settlement right, which was uh, you got so many acres for settling. And then there were head rights, which varied depending on the type of individual, whether it was the head of a family, the, his wife, children, slaves, all got a certain number of acres within the household. And concessions were uh, oftentimes used to pay for services. So some of the early ones uh, after, uh, right before the Louisiana Purchase actually were, uh, payment for militia service. And then they also had been assigned oftentimes, by the time the board got around to it, somebody moved on and sold the rights to somebody else. And so you'll see John Smith under Sam Jones. 
And again, most of the remaining grants were ratified July 4th, 1836. The result is all sorts of sources, some of which are repetitive and they're in various places, but I can really commend uh, if you've got an ancestor that early that might have gotten a Spanish land grant or French land grant, looking at the board minutes, and that's on Family Search Digital Films that I've given here. And if I didn't put those in the handout, please write them down. It makes it easier to find them. These were repeated to a certain extent in the American State Papers, which are in most libraries. The problem is, uh, Many genealogists reprint information or use information from this process without understanding it, without understanding what they've got or identifying the role of the record they've got in the process. And so it can be very, very confusing. So I'll work through an example who is an ancestor of mine, one of my fifth great grandfathers, Leonard Welker, who was uh, from Pennsylvania, settled in North Carolina for a time, then came to Southeast Missouri. So he arrived in Lincoln County, North Carolina, uh, from Lincoln County, North Carolina, about 1802, uh, despite, you'll see him included with a group that came with George Frederick Bullinger in 1800. I can find no record that indicates he came in 1800 and he's on the 1800 census in North Carolina. So I doubt that. Uh, he received permission from Lormier, the commandant of the district, via head right. And fairly typical of a grant confirmed by the first board of commissioners, atypical in that the intendant did the granting, not the governor. So here is uh, a survey done in 1806 when he went to the board, and uh, it's in the state archives. And it's uh, typical survey of uh, a grant that went before the board. And then when he uh, set forth his claim in the minutes, this is what it looks like, uh, the original. And again, that looks very much like the survey, not exactly, but similar. And it was uh, actually resurveyed uh, so that it wasn't following a stream, it was following compass bearings. Then if you look at the commissioner's minutes, he laid forth his claim and he was, there was a list that Larmier had produced of those who had permission to settle. And he was on that list, which was a good thing because it was more proof that he actually deserved the, the land. And then he actually had George Frederick Bullinger uh, swear that he, as a witness, that he had been on the land in 1802 and uh, actually cultivated it and had a wife and four children. Well, at this point, he had uh, actually seven total children. I think one of the sons was still in North Carolina. One was independent that I know of, and the other one was probably independent. He's kind of hard to track. Um, so they only, they didn't grant his whole claim. They only granted 400 R pins. A lot of times they'd cut back on the amount granted. And then he also provided testimony for his son, Jacob, who had bought somebody else's claim and then was carrying it forward to the board and uh, swearing that the original claimant had actually been there in 1802. It's very important that they be there by December 31st 1803, or else it wasn't valid claim. It was not prior to the purchase taking effect. So he moved on in 1804, but the original claimant had settled it earlier than that. And then the final confirmation was in 1809. And, uh, or it, 1810, 1809, it was laid over for decision, and then they finally confirmed it in 1810. In 1811, it was survey, had been surveyed and was granted a survey number. And if you go out today and look at a modern map, it's still there on the map as survey number 811. These will be odd shaped 
uh, parcels that you see out on the landscape that will tell you right away it's a confirmed Spanish French land grant. And his is 811. They were, they were numbered sequentially as they were surveyed. And you'll still see that in modern surveys too, the number. So if you look in the American State Papers for Leonard Welker, what's there? Two duplicates on his testimony on behalf of Jacob, his son, and he's listed in uh, two tables summarizing the grant and survey number. All this detail's not there. It's in the Board of Commissioners minutes. So that's why I say go to the minutes, go to the family search films, digitized films, and look at those minutes. Well, how do I get to that? Uh, the St. Louis Genealogical Society created an index, every name index of those minutes. And you can use that along with the film and it's in your handout under St. Louis Genealogical Society. Most libraries in the state have them. Many other genealogical libraries across the country has that uh, index, very handy. Now there are case files with all the documents associated with these. And because they were presented to the Board of Commissioners, they are a federal record and they are in the National Archives. There is a finding aid available in the Trans-Mississippi West. There's a lot of records, but there's not detail on what's in the case files. You'd have to go look at that. They haven't been microfilmed. You have to go to the National Archives I've not looked at one of these. I've talked to people that have looked at, at them and they say some of them are actually almost two or three feet worth of documents. So if you'd ever hit one of those, it would be a gold mine probably. So the summary of useful records for this process, survey and size of the survey, family size and composition and dates, use those dates with caution because I think some of them were stretched a little bit to get that 1803 date reached. Lists of permission to settle, uh, testimony before the board, and that's probably the most valuable you can access easily. The case file in the National Archives, tougher to access. And a lot of these that were in New Madrid County were affected by the New Madrid earthquakes and had not been completed in the confirmation process. If that was the case, Congress allowed people to uh, file for a new location or New Madrid claims certificate. Many of those were cashed in in the public domain outside Southeast Missouri, up on the Missouri River, in the area called Little Dixie. So, so suggested research strategy for these, look for your ancestor in the index to the commissioner's minutes, use the transcription, uh, which is only volumes four to six of the minutes, that's under uh, Ingmeyer in your uh, references in your handout, or even better use the microfilm, which is all the volumes that's in family search. Other sources uh, can confirm, provide maps and locate the grant in the past and now, including in the state archives. And if anybody ever looks at one of these case files, I'd love to hear about your experience. Now, one little caution. A lot of these claims were not confirmed until after areas had been surveyed and sold through as public land. And there wasn't enough land in the area where the claim existed to allow the person to get their claim. So then they had they got a certificate that they could cash in anywhere in the public domain that had not been sold. The last of those I found was in 1912. So here's somebody that settled in the 1790s and their heirs are not getting the claims settled until 1912. Wow. If you're researching in other states, uh, do preliminary research on land records, and a good place to start is the uh, wiki for, on family search. There are land and property wikis for many states. And also the National Genealogical Society's Research in the States series, which you can purchase via their website or are in most genealogical libraries.
In Missouri, uh, you've got the Missouri Digital Heritage that has uh, some of these. They do not lead to images of actual grants, but lead to selected uh, lists of documents and uh, transcriptions. So it's worth a check for your ancestor to see what's there. North Carolina has a really good site for land grants and images of the documents. which you can enter as a guest or you can register. Sec uh, by the way, this Kentucky one, the one that's in your handout may be incorrect because they recently relocated this, this service on the Secretary of State's website in Kentucky. So I encourage you to write this down if you wanna do research in some of the land grants in Kentucky. I'm not gonna guarantee you that all the land grants are accessible because they had several different uh, packages of land grants at different time periods and different locations in Kentucky. Another example is Virginia, which unfortunately has also relatively recently relocated uh, their land grants on the Library of Virginia's website. So again, copy this one down because it, differs from the one on your handout. lva-virginia.libguides.com slash land-grants. I hope that's the last of the ones that have been redone that I've gotten the presentation. All right, a little bit about uh, meets and bounds. Meets and bounds is a method for describing the extent using compass bear, bearing and distance and boundaries, uh, which is perimeter and adjacent properties of a piece of property. And perimeter may be described as just the line with the compass bearing and distance. It may be along a stream. It'll say following the meanders of the creek or something like that. And you hope to heck the creek hasn't changed course too much in 200 years. And uh, it may also say, uh, on John Jones' line, who would be a neighbor. So a lot of times, you, if you want the bearing and distance, you may have to uh, go to a John Jones survey to get that. Meets actually means measuring out. Bounds means boundaries. These could be rectangular. A lot of times I'll go to great tr trouble to plot one of these and then figure out I should have read through it initially because it's just a rectangle, but more often they're irregular. Uh, some of them may have literally dozens of calls. The, a call is a term you use for each compass bearing distance combination. These can be a challenge to locate on the landscape, um, but Missouri's French and Spanish land grants are an exception because they're on modern day maps if they show you know, township range section. So the, what you strive for is to find a grant that will anchor your ancestor's grant, which might be three grants away in a spot. And it's not an easy process. You have to know what you're doing. The historical background of meets and bounds, it's not to drive descendants of people getting the land crazy, it was an initial solution to the problem of permanently marking land and delineating boundaries. Surveys begin at some landmark, either a natural landmark like a tree, rock, or stream bank, or an artificial one like a corner that already exists, a stake or a road, or a bank of a river, uh, or that's natural, sorry. Uh, compass bearing and distance was measured to another landmark, often limited by adjoining properties and so forth until the survey enclosed the entire amount of granted land. Quarters are used to describe compass bearings, not 360 degree bearings. They're north so many degrees east, north so many degrees west, and those are 90 degree increments. Each of those south so many degrees east or south, so many degrees west. So I'll 
pop a couple of examples up here. This is a compass rose with north being zero or 360 or zero, if it's zero, like if it's due east, northeast, south or west, it'll just say north so many chains or poles. But what I want you to look at for a minute is find south 45 degrees west. Well, you're gonna go south here and then 45 degrees west here or right to that spot. And you put, if you're plotting these, you would put the corner you're measuring from in the center. And then you have to have a scale for the map to determine how far to go. And I do a workshop on this, but I can't do that in the presentation today. Um, what about north 62 degrees east? Well, you go up to north and then 62 degrees east right there. And you have a whole series of these with distances and corner descriptions. Most early surveys use poles to measure distance, which are 16 and a half feet. The software, even the free stuff that you can use, takes that into account. You don't have to remember it's 16 and a half feet. But other, some surveys that you'll find other units, feet, chains, which is 66 feet or 100 links or four poles, perches or rods, which is another, or another terms for poles, a link, which is one one hundredth of a chain, and an acre is actually 10 square chain. That's why an acre. A combination of a compass bearing and distance is termed a call. So here is a, a platted out uh, meets and bounds uh, piece of property. And it's marked with the lines, it's marked with the corners and the calls are marked as well. You can use software to plat these things. And I highly recommend you take a workshop uh, on how to do this. If you're gonna, if you're using this a lot in state land states, Deed Mapper is the Cadillac, you have to pay for it. It is really flexible though, and really useful. You can mesh it with uh, topographic maps. It's really valuable in that regard. But there are some freebies. Uh, tracked Plotter is one and plat plotter is another. And these allow map placement sometimes in plat plotter. Track plotter is the easiest if you just wanna know the shape of the land grant. But sometimes you can find a ready-made plat uh, that's a little bit better than what you typically find in uh, the land grant records, the surveyor's records. So uh, here's an example of one that came from a probate file. Some of them you can actually pick out on modern day plat maps if the land has not been chopped up too much uh, in, since it was originally granted. But this one was from a probate file. It was an original grant to Peter Edelman, uh, not one of my ancestors, Peter Edelman related. And uh, this was in his probate file because they divided the land up. And so they had to resurvey it and do a plat. Then of course, also recorded land grants or surveys. If you really get in detail on this, or if you've got a really tough uh, ancestry problem, you can sometimes solve that and pick out relatives by reconstructing a neighborhood. It requires at least one plat you can, you can uh, relate to modern day landmarks, either in the calls or by finding the property on a modern map. So you look for fence lines, roads, plat maps, anything like that that might allow you to tie it to a present day map. Then you find deeds identifying neighboring landowners or grants and plat these and locate them on a base map. So somebody here, I've actually got this one uh, saved on my computer because it involves uh, 
one of my family's pinson. Um, and it's showing who the neighbors are and who were the neighbors. The neighbors may have been uh, an individual's wife's relatives, or it may have been an individual's mother's relatives, or more distant relatives, or friends that you can look for elsewhere to maybe tie to your, your ancestor. So reconstructing a neighborhood is definitely not land records 101, but it is very useful um, in many situations. So that's all I'm really going to say much about uh, state land. What about public land states? The government, when it first got land in the Louisiana Purchase particularly, and, and then of course many others came along later, uh, their main goal was to get that land into private hands if possible. And so, but they had to do it according to a process because meets and bounds had been very chaotic in the state land states. And so uh, uh, they needed something a little more organized. So this, the process was public land uh, office process. So the federal government, yes, indeed, can own land. They own the land and the whole Louisiana purchased initially. And it doesn't involve meets and bounds typically. What it involves is a rectangular survey system. And that's not in the illustration. The illustration is intended to show one of the, they tried several options uh, for a rectangular survey system before they settled on one. And so some of these systems you may have to deal with if you had ancestors in Ohio, which was a major mess. Different parts of Ohio use different systems. Tennessee, Georgia, and a few other states. So beware, learn about the land records in the state you're interested in. It's systematic, no matter what rectangular system we're talking about, and typically right angles, although sometimes those had to be adjusted because the earth is round. And so if you try to put rectangles on the earth, it has to be finagled periodically. It's much easier to describe land locations and boundaries with this system. And you can go out, look at a map today. If it's got the, the sections marked on it, you can find your ancestor. Meets and bounds are only used for irregular land or to subdivide property, which usually happened after it was sold by the first title owner. The US public land system is the one that finally got settled on and is used in much of Missouri and many other states throughout the Western US, west of the Mississippi. It's used in Florida, it's used in the uh, old Northwest, uh, Illinois, um, the states north of the Ohio River and so forth. And uh, what it is, is you have a basic unit called a township, which is a little confusing because it's also used for the east-west uh, component of the system or of the north-south component of the system. So a township is six miles on a side. Each township is divided into 36 sections, one square mile each. Land parcels are then described in relation to north-south meridians, that is ranges that run north-south, and east-west baselines running east-west. So you have an initial meridian that's a north-south and an east-west baseline. Sections are further subdivided using a principle of quartering, which I'll show you in a minute. So here's the idea you have Here's a township grid and you have a baseline in the upper left and a principal meridian. Principal meridian divides the ranges. So if I go one township unit east of the meridian, I'm in range one east. The illustration there in the upper right is range four east. It's four township units east of the meridian. And if it's west of the meridian, it's range so many west. But the same token, the if it's the first township north of the baseline, 
it is township one north if it's above or one south if it's below the baseline. You can use that quite a bit. In fact, the prime meridian in Missouri is used for several states. What gets confusing is there's a different meridian for Illinois. So if you live on the east side of Missouri and hit the Mississippi River, and if the river changed course, you're gonna run into Illinois and you're gonna run into a completely different meridian and the section numbers are gonna to be totally haywire as you move over there. So uh, you gotta be aware of things like that. Now, if you look in the lower right, you occasionally had things that prevented survey into nice quarters and so like a lake. In that case, they would survey irregular uh, parcels and call them lots. And so if you look at the lower right, the system of quartering, each section is one mile on a side. And so the Northeast quarter is the upper one there. And that is 160 acres. The whole section is 640 in a typical section. And then you can quarter those down to get down to 40 acre parcels, or you can have them to get 80 acre parcels. So the west half of the southeast quarter and so forth. And I've seen these go down to 10 acres with quartering. Although not during the survey, they were usually done when people divided land up later. Specifics in Missouri, there's only one meridian, the fifth principal meridian. The initial point where the meridian meets the baseline is down in Arkansas. And the, the spot where they set that initial point has subsided over the years and is now in a swamp. So if you see that little illustration down at the bottom of the little marker, they have set a nice stone marker at the initial point. And the fifth principal meridian goes north from there and the baseline goes east and west from there. The survey proceeded very slowly in Missouri. You had the War of 1812 that interfered with surveying. You had a variety of other things, contracts being let out, uh, economic downturns later in the 18 teens. You had swamp in the southeastern part of the state. And what happened over time is those areas were finally surveyed by 1860 in the depths of the boot heel because it was so difficult getting survey crews in. Uh, most of it was surveyed by 1840, but lingered till 1860 in the boot heel. Those swamp lands were not very easy to sell. And so the federal government actually granted them to the state. The state tried to sell them for a few years around 1850, couldn't really sell them very effectively. So they magnanimously granted the swamp land in each county to the counties. So you may have a situation there where first title was sold out of the county courthouse, not out of the federal government, out of the federal land office, or it might've been sold out of the state capital for a very brief time. So you have to be aware of that if you had ancestors that lived in areas with a lot of swamp land. So again, here's north and south of the baseline. Once again, that's how you number the townships and east and west along baseline, that's how you number the ranges. The method for numbering the sections is a little, little wonky for some people. They started in the northeast corner with section one. And it's six miles on a side, so they went to section six, and then drop down to the next section for seven, went over to the east to section 12, then drop down for 13 and just so forth. Uh, there are other ways that could have been done. This is the way it was done. So you have to be aware of that, that part of your ancestors land may be in a section 36, 
and part may be in a section one. They're not that far apart, they're adjacent. So uh, pay close attention and it's always a good idea to plot it out. And again, typical section subdivisions, Northwest quarter, in this case, 160 acres. Then the Southwest corners, quarter is divided in half. Each half is 80 acres. Um, and then the quarters of quarters are 40. And then you can go even finer than that, uh, 10 acres. Although I've not seen it any farther down than 10 acres. So here's an example, a guy named Daniel Welker. He was actually Leonard Welker's son. And he got land in what became Cape Girardeau County or what was Cape Girardeau County. And uh, he got 80 acres. I don't think he was necessarily the first person to live on this land. He was just the one that got the first title. So if we look at this, it was the west half, southwest quarter, section eight, township 33 north, range 12 east. If I look at a modern map that shows the sections, townships, and ranges, I've got most of this map encompasses range 12 east and township 33 north. Point out one thing here. If I were up in the first six sections, here's one of those places where they had to adjust and the sections are two miles north south by one mile east west to make it come out on a round world. And so I go to section eight, right along I-55 there. I look at the west half of the southwest quarter and it's right there. And actually, he's probably buried there. There's a cemetery right about the middle of that. And uh, he's probably buried there. The land sold out of public land offices. So there's a variety of types of those. One is uh, cash purchase. There was credit sales, but not so much in Missouri. Uh, they decided that was a really bad idea. <laughs> Uh, and so by the time most of the land offices were open, it was cash purchases. Their preemption sales were somebody sat on the land for a long time until it was surveyed and they opened the land office. And then they could claim squatters rights, basically first shot at buying the land. Military bounty land was payment for service in certain wars up through the uh, Mexican war. Beyond that, there's no bounty land let out. Swamp land, I've talked about. School land was section 16 in many townships, was set aside for the state to sell to fund schools. And so those sales may be at the county courthouse, typically. The records are federal except for school land and there's certain other types of land other than school land that I'll not mention. There are case files that uh, relate to the process of purchase that are in the National Archives. And then warrants. Warrants were uh, typically given for payment for military service and they were transferable usually. You could sell them. So I got, I served in the War of 1812 in North Carolina. I'm living in North Carolina. I'm never going to move. So I'm not going to cash it in because there is no federal land to speak of in North Carolina. So I sell it to somebody that's heading west and they cash it in in a land office and get the land. Meanwhile, my name is also on that as the warranty. Steps to get land were, first of all, survey. Then application and entry. In other words, look at this, survey preceded application in this case. They had to survey the land first so that they could describe it and people could enter it in the land office. And those are done in tract books. Tract books for Missouri, there are some that are in the National Archives branch in Kansas City that are copies. The originals 
are not online as they are for some states. Other requirements if needed, uh, maybe bounty land warrant, affidavits, preemption documentation, these are all in land entry files or bounty land files in the National Archives. Then there's a receipt given out, which is also in the land entry file, a copy of it, and the final certificate or patent. The original patent is in the National Archives. A copy was given to the owner. You can access the uh, scans of the original patent online. This is a very valuable site for many people that have ancestors in state land states. It is a general land office website. It's in your handout. And typically what I use the most is search documents, but you can use, depending on the state you're researching, the survey notes may be available. The uh, tract book may be available. You just have to check, but not for Missouri, unfortunately. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so survey notes and I've got a bunch of examples set up already, but I'll just go ahead and do some examples very quickly because I notice we're cre we've crept up on an hour. So I click on search documents and I'm gonna look for another ancestor of mine, Henry Edelman in Missouri. What, we've talked about wild cards before and actually I have a, the wild card in this particular search um, boxes are is the percentage sign. Usually it's an asterisk, but in this one, it's a percentage sign. If you put an asterisk in there, it's going to say, uh-uh, no, can't do it. And so uh, that's my uh, guaranteed to work Edelman wild card search. And I'm interested in Henry. And he served in the War of 1812. So what I want to do is I want to see if he got a warrant because he lived long enough and see what happened with those warrants. That's what the W stands for. And he cashed one of them in himself in 1852 in Cape Girardeau County. And actually his daughter inherited, his oldest daughter inherited that land. But the other one, was not cashed in until 1860, and he had died by then. And actually, it lists Mary Edelman, his widow, as a patentee, but she actually sold a warrant to Joseph Leonard, and he cashed it in in Laclede County, which is all the way over in the south central part of the state. So what did I do there? I checked unchecked patentees. That's how you're going to find military service because it could, could have just as easily happened that uh, that warrant may have been sold and cashed in in Montana or Minnesota or w way away from uh, North Carolina where he did the service. So that's one way to figure out if an ancestor served in a war and lived long enough to get a land warrant. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and check patentees and uncheck warranties and see what I get there. He bought land from the land office as, as well, but because he's a patentee on the one warrant that he got, it's still going to pop up. So there's four other parcels in Perry County that he bought from the land office. Okay, so uh, in this example, I pretty much kind of went through what uh, Related documents, I didn't show you, but that will show you who got land adjacent to the person you're interested in, which is valuable because it may be fan club. And again, military bounty land was offered from the Revolutionary War to the Mexican War. If your ancestor got bounty land for the Revolutionary War, either they lived to be quite old or their widow lived for a, quite a while or they married a much younger woman for a second wife. So uh, there are Revolutionary War bounty land uh, warrants, but uh, not for everybody. And then all the way up to the Mexican War. 
one key piece of information uh, is if you want to request the file from the National Archives is the warrant number. And you can get that off of that General Land Office website. Again, many, if not most, were sold or assigned to others by the veteran or his widow. And I've already done the Henry Edelman example. So other sites to search um, for public land, swamp land, if you can find it, is in the state or county. Sometimes there will be a separate place you can find that. A lot of times they were recorded in the deed books as well as in other documents. Same with school land. And the state archives in Missouri has the above, plus in some states, some of the track books. National Archives Regional Branches, National Archives Washington, Bureau of Land Management. And you can also use this subscription site, History Geo which is really handy, but if it was an irregular lot survey, it's not gonna appear in History Geo. Uh, it's another subscription site that basically just plugs into the General Land Office site, but then also includes base maps. So you can look at people around your ancestor. You can search by states for a surname. You can do a lot of different things. Plus they have a map library that's getting bigger all the time. So if this is one of those where if you wanna to subscribe to something, that would probably be a useful one to subscribe to if you're gonna do a lot of land research. A bit on case entry files. Uh, they're at National Archives One, the main one in Washington, DC. They're not filmed, they're filed by land office and certificate number. It, you gotta be there to do it. And it can be terribly expensive if you want somebody there to research. And a lot of times you don't get a whole lot from it. So you can request it, but you need the name of the purchaser, the state, the name of the land office, the type of certificate it was, whether it was homestead, cash, credit, bounty land warrant, mining, timberland, there's a variety of others, and the certificate or patent number. And then it costs 50 bucks to search one. Uh, when I go there, I typically go through hundreds of them in a few days of research. So look at how much money I saved. <laughs> Here is an example of the bare bones you're going to get from one of these case entry files. It's a receipt and uh, a receiver's statement for the land. The only thing you're likely to get that you can't get online with this is I've seen a lot of individuals middle names. So you know their given name, their surname, but oftentimes you're just getting their initial and it will list their full name on these things. But it's not worth 50 bucks to get that in my estimation. So if you're searching, you wanna know the information specific to the state and where to search. So look at the family search wiki, uh, you can use a search engine and search for land and the state or the county or whatever you're interested in. Don't stop in one place. Be alert for someone else completing a process if your ancestor started it. I've got an ancestor in Pennsylvania, for example, that is listed as a landowner on track or on the plat maps as a neighbor to other people. He is listed in deeds as a neighbor. That is it. That's all I've got. He never is in the warrants. He's never in the entry. I've not seen him anywhere else. So in that case, I had to look at other places and research the neighbors to get to that information. Realize you may have to use resources in several places, the library, online, and state repositories. If they had land, they had to get it from somewhere. Your job is to figure out where. And I'll warn you, next time we'll talk about deeds. Deeds may not have been recorded for decades. So next time, it's gonna get even better. We're gonna talk about records generated by title transfer, which oftentimes have better information for uh, determining relationships than these first titles. Thanks everyone. Thank you.